because of a hundred years of progressivism had taken America right to the brink and it was this far away from going over the edge and we've got to stay so if you look back in the Old, Test Old Testament there's a lot of reprieves in the Old Testament a lot of second chances but how many third chances were there folks? Not, not many that I can remember so we have to take advantage of this opportunity we have been given this God given opportunity to turn this country around because if we don't take advantage of it we've got only ourselves to blame for the consequences folks the second thing I'll say about the election I know there's a lot of political activists in the room you know, you, you, you write out a lot of checks, you do a lot of door knocking and phone banking and putting up yard signs and, you know, you're always holding meetings and that kind of thing. And you do, do this year after year after year with very little thanks for it. But tell me, was all of that hard work worth it on election night 2016? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Or would you do it all over again to get, get exactly the same result? Exactly. Because that election gave people hope. And not just Americans hope. All over the world people, people were terrified of the consequences of Hillary Clinton becoming president. And when that was lifted, that was a huge sigh of relief. You probably could have heard from New Zealand, you know. So... It was worth it because it gave hope to our, for our future, for our families, our grandchildren, etc. It's not a guarantee by any means, but it's a shot, right? Now the third thing I'll say, the Germans have a, a, a lovely word, I reckon it's, it's, it's schadenfreude. And it means to take pleasure in the pain of others. And it's not a very noble thing, right? You don't boast about enjoying schadenfreude. But you tell me this. On election night 2016, about 2 o'clock in the morning, when they panned the Democratic Party headquarters, and you saw those little snowflakes bawling their eyes out and hugging each other, did you feel a little bit of schadenfreude? <laughs> and do you think after eight years of Obama trashing your country that you deserved it? Yeah. Yes. Well, hang on to that feeling, people, because I want you to feel it again in two weeks' time, and in 2020, and 2022, and 2024, and beyond. Because we do not want the opposition feeling it for a very long time, people. Yeah. Is that a fair comment? Yes. yes. Hang on to that feeling. So I, what I do is, my main specialty is um, national security. But I deal with the element of it that is not often discussed in this country, though I, I believe it should be. Now, I'm sure there's ex-military people in the room, right? One or two? Thank you. Thank you for your service. Well, is it true that, that you people, you, you swore an oath to defend your constitution from all enemies, foreign and domestic, right? So which are more dangerous in the long run? An enemy over there in a uniform with a gun pointed at you or an enemy in a suit and tie in your Congress trashing your constitution every chance they get. Has anybody in the room ever had to undergo any form of FBI background check or security clearance yep. for any form of government position? Yeah. Two or three in the room, right? <coughs> well, is it true that they can, they can be pretty rigorous? They check out your family background, they interview your childhood friends, they check out your financial affairs, political affiliations, foreign travel, um, bounce checks, everything. I had a friend who applied for a mid-level government job in Washington DC during the Obama years and the FBI sent two agents all the way to Canada to interview my friend's communist uncle. On the strength of that interview, my friend, who was a good conservative, was denied that position. Not because he was a communist, because his uncle was. Now, I actually support that, folks. Because when you're dealing with the national security of the most important country in the world, the leader of the free world, which has a history 
which is a whole bunch of enemies out there who have a history of using your weak and dishonest to betray you, I think you do have a right to be very careful about who serves in the federal government. But what if you're a young Marxist radical or a far leftist who hangs around with the Communist Party or some fronts for the Muslim Brotherhood? And if you're not sure who the Muslim Brotherhood is, it's a sort of secret, semi-secret society based in the Middle East that set up Hamas and Al-Qaeda and ISIS, but works legally in America through the Council on American-Islamic Relations, Muslim American Society, etc. So you hang around with these groups, the Communist Party, whatever, they control your local DFL chapter, which they do all over the state, and they get you elected to Congress where you may serve on the Armed Services Committee, or the Homeland Security Committee, or even the Intelligence Committee. How much of an FBI background check do you need for that one, folks? Zero, zero. Absolutely zero. Because the people are supposed to vet the candidates, right? And the media is supposed to help you do it, right? Well, how's that been working out? You see the problem there? If the media is on the wrong side, the bad guys get a pass. So you get elected to Congress. See, so if you look at your own state, for instance, you know, you had a man here, uh, Paul Wellstone, some years back. Senator Paul Wellstone, very highly regarded in a lot of places. He's a bit of an icon. Died in a plane crash in 2002, 2003. I believe he was going to stand for president. That was his plan. Well, he was heavily involved in a major Marxist group called Democratic Socialists of America. And he was a committed socialist. And he went down to Colombia to meet with the, the terrorist groups in Colombia, all the while serving as your senator, your highly regarded man. Well, his legacy was the Wellstone School. And that has trained a whole bunch of your politicians, including Amy Klobuchar, also, Keith Allison was a trainer at the Wellstone School. And Tim Waltz, who's standing as your governor, was also trained at the Wellstone School. So you got three of your major politicians who came out of a Marxist movement running in your state right now. But if you we go, um, and then you got Betty McCollum, who is very heavily involved with um, Laotian communists, uh, been to Laos a few times. She got a lot of Lao people in her, in, her, in her district. Then you've got Colin Pedersen, who's regarded as a sort of moderate. But he has been, he's very, very close to the leader of the Communist Party in this area. And he's been to Cuba three times. And then you've got Rick Nolan, who's thankfully standing down. Look, he went to Cuba in 1977 and went fishing with Fidel Castro. You know, so virtually your entire DFL delegation in this state has a Marxist background. And if you go back in this state for the history of this state, you've always had a bit of a socialist problem here because back in the early days of the 20th century, you had a major influx of Finnish people up into the Iron Range. Now, most of them came here because they were fleeing Finland, which was occupied by Russia at the time, because they were Finnish communists. And the Russians chased them out. This was before the revolution. So you had a whole of your northern area was basically run by communists for many years. And that tradition still is, is in that area now. And then you had, um, when they set up the DFL in the 1930s, it was set up by the Communist Party in this state. The Communist Party had a major input in the setting up in the DFL and ran it for many years. And that input is still there today. That influence is still there. So, you know, and then you had groups later on. You had the Freedom Road Socialist Organization, which is very, very, very active in your state. And they work with Amy Klobuchar. They work very closely with Keith Allison and some of your other members of Congress. And you also have a group called Democratic Socialists of America. Now, despite its name, it is a completely Marxist communist organization. They've got about 800 members in the Twin Cities. 
They've got a chapter in Duluth, and they've got a chapter about 40 strong here in Rochester, plus a few others scattered around the state. And they are working behind Tim Waltz. They're working behind your congressman all over the state. They are the people that basically um, gave you Obamacare. Single-payer health care is their big issue, which is why Keith Allison pushes it, because he is part of their orbit. He has been for many, many years. So you've got a big socialist presence in this state. It's sort of underground. It works through the DFL. It works through your colleges, your unions, your universities, and they basically run the policies of the DFL. That's how it goes. Now we look at what's happened in more recent times. Underground, it works through the DFL. It works through your colleges, your unions, your universities, and they basically run the policies of the DFL. You've had a major Islamization in this state. The red, the red has basically paved way for the green. Because the idea was Minnesota is a very welcoming and friendly Midwestern state. It's a very open place where people are very accepting. And it was deemed as a very good place to set up an Islamic Marxist enclave in the Midwest. So very early on, the Marxist organized um, refugee resettlement into the state. Now that has two, um, a couple of advantages for the left. One is it increases the left wing political base. You know, you see in places like Wilmar, which is now third Muslim, you see in places like St. Cloud, which is heavily Muslim, they are not going to be conservative regions much longer, people. Because the Somalis are going to be bussed around all over the place by the unions to vote multiple times, and they're not going to be voting Republican folks. We know that. So the idea is that, you know, the Somalis are not brought in here and put in Los Angeles or Boston or Portland because the left already has those places. They're coming into the conservative Christian Midwest because conservative Christians are the number one enemy of the political left in this country. And if we can put a whole lot of left-leaning Muslims right in, the, in your backyard, that's going to either drive you out or drive you under. And they're going to take a foothold in this state. You've also got a very generous welfare system in this state, which is another incentive for the left to pour people in here. So you're a state that's on the knife edge. Beautiful state, great people, but you are at risk. You are risking losing your future here because you are going to be outvoted in a very short number of years, especially if you elect someone like Keith Allison as the top law enforcement official in this country, in this state. You imagine what he's going to do for sanctuary city um, legislation, for instance, sanctuary state, um, what he's going to do to suppress your freedom of speech. You know, this is a man who demanded that Jeff Bezos take every bit of hate literature off the Amazon catalogs. And that means anything designated as hate literature by the extreme far left Southern Poverty Law Center. That means anybody, anything that's remotely conservative or remotely patriotic, that's now hate literature. And you can imagine what Keith Allison would do to suppress your freedom of speech if he gets the chance to do so. Allison has got an, is a red, is a, he was elected with the help of the Communist Party. He's worked with the Freedom Road Socialist Organization, with Maoists and Trotskyists. He was also, um, and he's basically a, a very close ally now of Democratic Socialists of America, and has had, had DSA members on his staff. He's as Marxist as you can get. And then there's the Muslim side. You know, he was actively involved for several years with the Nation of Islam, which is also a pro-Cuban organization, by the way. He was, uh, then he became an Orthodox Muslim, and he went to Mecca in 2008, paid for by the Muslim American Society, a Muslim Brotherhood front group, where he met with Iranian politicians. He also met with a, a, a Saudi banker, 
whose job it was to pay money to the families of suicide bombers. See, when they get people to kill themselves, they say, well, you go and kill yourself for Allah and we will fund your family for the next few years. That's their incentive. So Keith Allison met with the man who arranged those payments. Allison is as hardcore anti-American as you can get, folks. He's an absolute traitor to this country. No question, I'm very, very confident in making that statement. And the good news is he's currently seven points behind Doug Wardlow, right? And the great thing is Wardlow is not just another rhino average Republican. He is a very good constitutional conservative. So you have a very clear option here. And I'm not going to endorse anybody right now, but I'm just telling you, you've got to do everything you can to defeat Keith Allison because the ramifications of that will be felt right across America, folks. Not just this state. You learn the gratitude of all, all the other 49 if you can get rid of that guy. Because he's going he's to use his platform and your tax dollars to wage war on the Trump administration if he gets the chance. And the other thing you've got to do, is do your best to defeat Tim Waltz. Jeff Johnson is a good guy. You know, you've got several races, you know. Get out and vote, but don't just you get out and vote. Get every single one of your conservative friends that you can to vote. The only way we lose this race on Allison, the only way that Allison wins if our base doesn't come out. It's the only way. We have more than enough patriots in this state to win all of those races, all those main races. The trouble is a lot of our people don't vote and especially in the Christian community, a lot of them do not vote. There is enough power in the Christian communities in this state to make this a red state if they so choose, chose to get off their backsides and got and went and did their civic duty. Okay, and that's the reality. So you've got a few issues in your state, but the good news is I think you're going to win some this time and you're going to make some headway. And the more headway you make, the more money is going to come in next election cycle because it looks more positive and you can really get things rolling here. You really can. The Midwest is going more and more conservative and you need to be part of that wave, folks, and you can be. Anybody here, anybody here, any Vietnam veterans here tonight by any chance? You, sir? Okay, anyone else? Well, first I'll say thank you. And I'd like to ask a couple of questions and uh, one of them is very stupid, but I think you'll see where I'm going. Was the Vietnam War lost in the jungles of Vietnam? Every veteran says no. So had you been allowed, is it true that you had some pretty tough rules in Vietnam? Like your fighter pilots weren't allowed to shoot unless they were shot at first. You couldn't invade North Vietnam. You couldn't mine Haiphong Harbor. Often you were not allowed to um, chase the enemy in hot pursuit and that kind of thing. Is any of that true? So here's the dumb question. Did those rules in any way hamper your ability to fight and win that war? I think your face tells me the answer to that. So is it also true that when you withdrew, your government defunded the South Vietnamese military, guaranteeing a communist takeover? Well, I know, for instance, I got a, I, I, I tell you a little story I got from the head of the South, Admiral Ace Lyons, the former head of the South Pacific Fleet, former Admiral of the Seventh Fleet. He said that during the Vietnam War, you had a Secretary of State, a man called Dean Rusk. And every night, Dean Rusk would get the bombing orders for North Vietnam over his desk, exactly where your bombers were going to fly the next day. And every night he would pass those orders to the, to the Swedish embassy in Washington, D.C., who would send them to the North Vietnamese. So they knew exactly where your planes were going to fly so they could put their guns in just the right place to bring them down. That's how high level this went, folks. I say this, that war was deliberately sabotaged in your Congress by people like Father Drynan from Massachusetts, 
who were working hand in glove with the Communist Party USA, which was taking its orders directly from the Communist Party of North Vietnam, which was allied, which was basically was taking its orders from the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, which was allied to the Communist Party of North Vietnam. Do you think there might have been a little bit of treason going on there, folks? And how many of those traitors in your Congress who deliberately sold, you lost 58,000 young men in that war, people, of your uncles and fathers and football team buddies and hunting friends and school friends, church, church fellow church members. I guarantee everybody in this room was touched by that war in some way. 58,000 young Americans died in a war they were not allowed to win, betrayed by people in your own Congress. And how many of those congressmen paid a single penalty for what they did, folks? One of them became Obama's Secretary of State, a man called John Kerry, sometimes known as Jane Fonda with less testosterone. And another one was a man called John Conyers. Remember him? Had to resign in disgrace from Congress next, last year. He'd been there 140, 160 years, I believe. So John Conyers, I regard as your most single treasonous congressman. He should have been in jail years ago. And the reason I say he was the most dangerous is this. Because... John Conyers controlled the Judiciary Committee. He was the ranking Democrat on the Judiciary Committee. And when the Democrats controlled the House, which they did for over 40 years, he was the chairman of that committee. Now, you have an organization in this country, folks, that is uh, dedicated to removing spies and terrorists and traitors from your government. It's called the FBI. So which committee in Congress does the FBI answer to, folks? It's the Judiciary Committee, most powerful committee, as does the Justice Department. So the FBI arrests them and the Justice Department is supposed to prosecute them. Okay, the bad guys. So on that Judiciary Committee, you have a woman called Judy Chu from California. Now she is a leader, was a long time leader of the biggest front group for the Communist Workers' Party, a pro-Chinese militant outfit. She has been described in the Chinese press as China's best friend in your Congress. And you should see Judy Chu go off on the FBI whenever they have the temerity to arrest one of the 25,000 Chinese spies currently operating in this country. You are racist. The FBI is a racist. <coughs> The FBI is a racist organization. You're only picking on these people because they're Chinese. She has arranged special sensitivity training for the FBI so they're no longer racist towards Chinese spies. Then you have Luis Gutierrez from Illinois. Um, Luis Gutierrez was a leader of the pro-Cuban Marxist-Leninist Puerto Rican Socialist Party. Arrest ele elected several times in Chicago with the help of pro-Chinese Maoist communists and is a very long time supporter of the Council on American Islamic Relations. And then you have Jerry Nadler, who is now going to take John Conyers top spot on that committee. And if the Democrats take back the House in two weeks time, Jerry Nadler has threatened to reinvestigate Brett Kavanaugh and he will lead the impeachment of President Trump. Jer Jerry Nadler is a 40-year veteran of Democratic Socialists of America. He's been a member since at least 1977. He is a committed Marxist. And he will be the one in charge of the FBI and in charge of the impeachment of your president. And then you go back to John Conyers himself. That man had a 50-year history with the Communist Party USA, 40 years with the uh, Democratic Socialists of America, 30 years with the Workers' World Party, which supports North Korea and Cuba and Iran. They are the people who ripped down Confederate statues in North Carolina and Louisiana, and is a big-time supporter of the Council on American-Islamic Relations. 
John Conyers is a hardcore anti-American Marxist Leninist, as hardcore as you can get. So what do you think would have happened to the FBI if they had come to John Conyers and Jerry Nadler and Judy Chu and said, well, we need to start investigating congressmen. We think some of them are bad. What do you think would have happened to their budget next year, folks? Do you think the FBI is stupid enough to bite the hand that feeds it? So you have a situation, if you're a Marxist radical like Keith Ellison, because people say to me, well, how could, if, if Ellison is as bad as I say he is, how could he possibly be serving in the Congress? Well, there are no security checks in Congress. The media is not going to touch you. And the FBI doesn't dare to go near you. The FBI has not investigated congressmen in this country since at least the 1940s. At least. And I'll give you another example. It's in my movie, and I hope you'll get the movie and see this. You've got a man called Andre Carson who serves. Um, he's from Indiana, one of your two Muslim MP, uh, members of Congress. And I've got him on tape at a Muslim Brotherhood front group in Connecticut in 2012. And he gets up in front of the audience with a big grin on his face, and he says this, I understand there are people in the audience spying on us. You are here undercover, looking at what we are doing, because you believe we are here plotting to destroy this country. Well, I say to you, Allah will not allow you to stop us. This man currently serves on the House Intelligence Committee, folks. He oversees the CIA, the NSA, the FBI, the DEA, and all 16 of your three-letter intelligence agencies. There's at least four Marxists on the Intelligence Committee, at least five on the Homeland Security Committee, and a similar number on the Armed Services Committee. On the Senate side, when you saw Mr. Kavanaugh get such a hard time, there were 10 Democrats on the Senate, um, Senate Judiciary Committee. Every single one of them has a Marxist background, from Dianne Feinstein on down. Do you think they're ever going to let a constitutionalist go through without a battle, folks? Not a, You could put Mother Teresa up and they would still attack her, folks. So you have got, in, this, in your state right now, you, you've got in your country right now, I would say around 100 members of your house, including most of the Minnesota delegation, and about 20 members of the US Senate, including half of the Minnesota delegation, who are so enmeshed in neo-Marxism, Muslim Brotherhood fronts, or hostile foreign powers like Iran or China or Cuba, they couldn't pass an FBI background check to drive a school bus. They wouldn't be allowed to clean the toilets at any military base in your country, folks. That's the situation right now. How long can you survive when a quarter of your Congress and House is basically working for the other side? That's where your problems are coming from, people. That's why you've got a nuclear deal with Iran. That's why you've got Obamacare. That's why you got normalization of relations with Cuba, because all these people are working for the other team, folks. Now, I want to talk about what I consider is the single biggest national security threat this country faces right now. And it's not Russia, and it ain't China, and it ain't Iran or Cuba, and it isn't ISIS or Al Qaeda. I'm not minimizing any of those things. They're all hugely dangerous. But the thing that could destroy this country more surely than anything else is illegal immigration. And I want to explain why I say that, folks, because mostly we don't discuss it as a national security issue. Though you can see with that caravan coming across the border now, that is an invasion, folks. There's no other way to put it. So this started out in California in the 1950s with a Communist Party member named Bert Corona. He got a whole bunch of money from Chicago, from Saul Alinsky, the mentor of, uh, of uh, Hillary Clinton and the, 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 the inspiration of Obama. And he, he set up a whole network through the southern border states 
of support groups for illegals. So he, brought, he encouraged a whole bunch of people to come across the border, got them work in factories and farms, got their kids into school and got them settled. Now, Corona died in 2002, but he trained a whole bunch of people to carry on his work for him. And three of them work very closely in California today, and they have transformed that state, and the spillover is transforming your nation. The first of them is a man called Antonio Villagorosa. He was the mayor of Los Angeles, a hardcore Marxist. He used to go down to Cuba to cut sugar cane for the Castro brothers. He turned Los Angeles into a full-on sanctuary city. He forbade the LAPD from enforcing immigration laws and the illegals flooded in to Los Angeles and Orange County and flipped those regions. Second member of the group is a Communist Party supporter named Gil Cedillo. Until recently, the Democratic head of the California State Senate and the man who recently arranged for illegal aliens in California to get driver's licenses. The third member of this little group, a, a hardcore Marxist, the most powerful woman in Southern California, in my opinion. She serves on the Democratic National Committee. Her name is Maria Elena Durazzo. She is, was the head of the California AFL-CIO. She organized a massive union-driven and union-paid-for Latino voter registration drives and get-out-the-vote efforts that added hundreds of thousands of new Latino voters to the California rolls in the last 15 years, legal and illegal. The result of this deliberate Marxist program has been to turn California from a reddish purplish state to solidly blue. You cannot elect a conservative in California statewide now for love nor money. All result of this deliberate Marxist program. And that is very significant when it comes to presidential elections because California has the largest number of electoral college votes. And if you control them, you've got a big head start when it comes to electing a president. Which is why those people are now moving on Texas, because Texas has the number two um, number of electoral college votes. And if they ever succeed there, folks, the math makes electing a Republican impossible. So the leader of that movement now was a man called Alisao Medina. He's a member of Democratic Socialists of America, a leader of the SEIU union, and he was Obama's personal advisor on all issues of immigration, amnesty, etc. So, Medina, you, you ask, you know, Medina is the man who got the amnesty bill pushed through your Senate about four years ago, and he almost got it through the House. And he would have got it through the House had it not been for the Tea Parties, folks. The Tea Party saved America that year. So, but the big question is, you know, why is the big push for amnesty? You know, why are they so hardcore on it? Why do they want darker? Why are they so absolutely refusing to build any kind of wall? Well, the answer is pretty simple. And Alisao Medina laid it out. I've got him again. I've got him on tape saying this. He's in the movie. He gets up in front of a crowd, a big progressive audience in 2009, and this is what he says. Passing amnesty for our 11 million undocumented workers is the number one, the number one priority of the progressive movement. We have to get citizenship and voting rights for these people. And did he talk about compassion or reuniting families or the nation of immigrants or giving immigrants a break or being welcoming. Not one single word, folks. All he said was this. In 2008, Latinos voted overwhelmingly for progressive candidates. If we give these people citizenship and voting rights, they will stand with our movement. That will give us at least 8 million more Democratic Party voters. That will give us a governing majority, not for the next few election cycles, forever. Do a little bit of math, people. Mitt Romney lost his election by 2.5 million votes. 
Donald Trump won his election by 200,000 votes, thanks to the wisdom of your founding fathers and the Electoral College, and actually lost the popular vote by 3 million. MIT recently released a study saying there were 22 million illegals in the country now. I've heard credible reports that it's over 40 million. But let's go with 22. That will give the Democrats 15, 16 million new voters instantly. So when the margins are two, two million, few hundred thousand, and the Democrats get another 15 or 16 million votes overnight, what does that do to your country, folks? Texas is gone, Arizona's gone, Georgia's gone, Florida's gone. You've lost it. You can never, ever elect another conservative. Why do you think Hillary Clinton promised to legalize every single illegal immigrant in this country within a hundred days of taking office? Why do you think, folks? Because illegal immigration amnesty is the road to the one-party state. And if you think they mean a one-party state like France or Germany, that's not what they're after, people. They are after Cuba. They are after Venezuela. Because the Democratic Party today is run by the people who protested the Vietnam War and supported the North Vietnamese and the people who went down to Nicaragua to support the Sandinista communists in the 80s. They are the people running today's Democratic Party and they want their revolution before they die, folks. And illegal immigrant amnesty is their number one way of achieving it. Why do you think they're so hardcore opposed to the wall, folks? I guarantee you this. If 80% of the illegals in this country voted Republican, Obama would have had the biggest wall on the border you have ever seen. And here's a little, little, uh, little side thing. An immigration officer told me this. How do you know how secure your borders are? It is by the price of heroin on your streets. Now, heroin is dirt cheap in America right now, folks. It's killing 60,000 young people a year. I bet you one or two people in this room know someone who suffered from it. It's all over. The fentanyl comes in from China to Mexico across the border, and the heroin comes from South America through Mexico or through Cuba to America. And it's killing 60 to 70,000 of your young people every year because your Democrats are so hungry for power, they do not ever want to seal that border. They are criminal people. Simply criminal. So you came on election night 2016, folks. You came that close to losing your country. That close. And I still don't think most of the Republican leadership has any idea of how close they came or what they're facing. The grassroots does, but not the GOP leadership, unfortunately. And it, well, I think President Trump does, but I don't think uh, Mitch McConnell and Paul Ryan have any clue. So, is anybody, speaking of President Trump, has anybody ever seen as much vitriol and contempt directed at a sitting president as this one? Even close? Not under Reagan, not under Bush? So why do they hate him so much, folks? I think there's two reasons. The first is very easy to understand. Because the Democrats were so pumped up on election night, so believing their own propaganda, that when it all went south, they were like a bunch of kids who thought they're going to get the best bike you've ever seen for Christmas, and they got a pair of socks, right? And they are bitter and angry. But you should get over that in a week or a month, shouldn't you? Don't you? Wouldn't you think? You know, you sort of move on. You know, we've we've all had disappointment. But this is the real reason, I think. See, if you're a modern Democrat, and I do not mean your next door neighbour who votes for the DFL and is a patriotic American who loves the country but still thinks he's voting for Harry Truman. You know, you all know people like that. 
I'm talking about the modern Democratic Party leadership, the Marxist leadership of the modern Democratic Party. See, you believe in identity politics. You believe people are not individuals. They are part of groups who can be manipulated to achieve power, called identity politics. If you're black, you've got to be a Democrat, you know? So the Democrats believe they own these groups. They own the black population. They own the white union guys out in Pennsylvania and Ohio. They own the Native Americans. They own the Latinos. They own a big chunk of the Asian American population. They own the soccer moms and the, and the millennials. These are their base. And you better not come after their base, folks, because that what, that's what puts them in power. So when Donald Trump went out to those white union guys in Pennsylvania and Ohio and said, so this is what NAFTA and voting Democrat has done for you? Where's all those big union paying jobs we used to have in those great big factories? I see a rust belt. I see despair and decay and unemployment and deserted factories. You cannot defend your country without an industrial base. We're going to bring back the industry to the Midwest and bring back those jobs. Are you with me? And for the first time in their lives, a whole bunch of those union guys went into a polling booth and they ticked a Republican. Not a Republican, President Trump. And when he went to the black communities, it says, so this is your inner city. This is what 50 years of voting Democrats done for you. You know, drugs, unemployment, run-down facilities, hopelessness. You know, you know, why don't you guys vote for me? What do you got to lose? And a whole bunch of them said, heck yeah, and they did. And that was enough to make the difference, folks. Black approval of President Trump is now 35%. That hasn't happened since Abraham Lincoln, people. Right? You know? So this is freaking the Democrats out. Because they understand, even if we don't, that if this president is successful and keeps the taxes coming down and gets the wall built and keeps the regulations coming off business and opens up the energy fields in this country so he can drill your own oil and gas again, he un they understand there'll be an economic boom and wages will start rising and all those Bernie kids will be able to move out of their mom's basement and get $100,000 a year jobs and get married and have kids and mortgages. And they'll forget about the socialism pretty quick, people. So they understand this country's at a tipping point. If President Trump's successful, the Democratic brand crumbles. If they lose even 10% of the black population, they're in trouble. They use, lose 10% of that, plus 10% of the Latino population, plus a few percent of those white union guys, they're done. They're out of power for many years. They are fighting for their survival, folks. That's why they're so vicious. They are cornered rats. They really are. And they're throwing everything at you to try and win the next election, and the one after that, and they're going to do, then they can get amnesty and everything will be okay again. Right? But they are facing annihilation if this president succeeds. You know, you saw the State of the Union speech. President Trump says, black unemployment is the lowest it's ever been. And the whole Congressional Black Caucus was scowling. You know, did you see one year go America? One year, that's great from the Democrats. One you see one smile through the whole speech? They hate him, people, because he can destroy them. And they know that. So this is the Democrat plan. First part is real simple to see. Destroy the president. Impeach the president. Um, ridicule the president. Slow down the president. Um, you know, ridicule his base. Split his base. Discourage his base. Um, shut down conservative Twitter, Facebook pages, all of this thing, everything they can so we can't get our message out. Set Antifa on us so that we have to close our meetings down. Anything they can do. So that's the first part. 
The second part is a little more subtle, but it's even more dangerous. Anybody remember the old um, Jesse Jackson Rainbow Coalition of the 1980s? Okay. A great scamster Jesse Jackson, right? He ran twice for president and nobody gave him a chance. He was regarded as a nutcase even then, right? But he, got, he ran in 84 and 88, and in 88 he got 7 million votes and fourth in the Democratic primary. And that surprised a lot of people. Now the way, way he did it was very simple, very clever. He ran a rainbow coalition strategy. He got the progressive whites together with the progressive blacks, progressive Latinos, progressive Asian Americans, Native Americans, gay Americans, Muslim Americans, Asian Americans. And this is his words. So he had the yellow stripe, the green stripe, the lavender stripe, the red stripe, the brown, the yellow, you know, the white stripe, the rainbow coalition. But in those days, minorities were about 12% of the population. Now they're 38%. So his idea was ahead of its time. Now the Rainbow Coalition folded after 88 when Jesse Jackson went on to other scams. He's out in Silicon Valley shaking them down right now. So the Rainbow Coalition was largely run by Maoist communists, pro-Chinese communists, particularly a 3,000 strong organization called the League of Revolutionary Struggle. And after the Rainbow Coalition collapsed, the League of Revolutionary Struggle dissolved and most of them went into the Democratic Party, including a young man called Stephen Phillips. Now he was a black law student at Stanford University. He was a League, a league guy, and he was the uh, Jesse Jackson's full-time student organizer in 1988. Took a whole year off college to work on the, on the campaign. And he learned a lot. Now, in 1992, Steve Phillips married his Stanford University sweetheart, a young woman called Susan Sandler. And she was the daughter of Herb and Marion Sandler, who ran a big savings and loan out of California called Golden West. Now, they sold that for $2.8 billion to Wachovia, which bankrupted Wachovia, which then had to amalgamate with Wells Fargo. But they got their $2.8 billion and they put it into the, half of it into the progressive movement. They fund the Center for American Progress, ProPublica, and, and funded many candidates around your country. So this gave young revolutionary Steve Phillips access to hundreds of millions of dollars. Now, what do you think a young revolutionary would do with that, folks? So he became the sort of ambassador to the, to the Sandler family. He, be, he became very prominent in the Democratic Party. And in 2005, he was sent to a meeting in Atlanta, Georgia, with George Soros, Tom Steyer, Norman Lear of People for the American Way, and a whole bunch of other billionaires. And they set up a group called the Democracy Alliance. This is very, very secretive. It's now 150 members strong, and they put billions of dollars into the progressive movement. And Steve Phillips guides them on where it should go. So he's a very powerful man. Now, in 2008, Steve Phillips got $10 million together, which was chicken feed. And he did a voter registration drive in 18 southern states amongst the black and Latino communities. And that was for a young man called Barack Obama. That's what got Obama ahead of Hillary Clinton. There would have been no President Obama without Steve Phillips and his buddies. Today he runs a group called the Demo uh, Democracy in Colour and another one called Power Pack. He's got about four or five groups and the whole purpose is to gather a whole bunch of money and direct it behind candidates of color because they're rerunning the rainbow coalition strategy you see by running candidates of color whenever they can latino asian american black some white but mainly of color now steve phillips has written a book and this lays out his blueprint the book was called brown is the new white it's endorsed by Nancy Pelosi and Barack Obama, and it's the, the Bible of the Democratic Party now. It's their strategy for winning. Because he argues very simply, he says this, 
In America today, 23% of the electorate are white, are progressives of color. Black, Latino, Asian American, Native American, etc. 28% of the electorate are white progressives. They will vote Democrat if Adolf Hitler was on the ticket. They are hardcore, locked-in Democrats. 23% plus 28% is 51%. And that's what he calls the new American majority. You Google that phrase, people, new American majority. It's all over the left now. And so Steve Phillips' argument is very simple. Democrats, forget about going to the middle. Don't worry about spending millions of dollars trying to get a few percentage of people in the middle to switch to the Democrats. Instead, put all of that money into your progressive base, especially voter registration drives amongst black, Latino, Muslim, and Asian American communities. All those communities that lean Democrat but don't normally vote in high numbers. See, right now they're targeting Arizona as one, one example. And Steve Phillips, Trump won that by 200,000 votes. But there were 600,000 Latinos who could have voted but didn't. And that's who Steve Phillips is putting his money into. And they've got a governor, a gubernatorial candidate out there, David Garcia, a Latino, who is a Steve Phillips protege. So that's the strategy they're using. Now... Steve, uh, they're doing this. You see this right across the south. They're running with Andrew Gillum in Florida right now, a Steve Phillips protege, a, a Marxist, a black guy. They're running behind Stacey Abrams in Georgia. And they're running Ben Jealous in Maryland and a few others around the south. And their aim is to tip North Carolina. Their aim is, they're targeting five states particularly. Their aim is to tip North, the, to, to Georgia and Florida this cycle and Arizona and next cycle they hope to get North Carolina then a couple of cycles down the road to get Texas and they're putting huge amounts of money into these states right now they're backing Beto O'Rourke right now in Texas um, putting a whole bunch of money down there Stacey Abrams, the governor, their, their, their candidate for Georgia, the governor there, puts it very well. She says, Democrats, stop wasting your money trying to turn atheists into Catholics. Get the Baptists to go to church. In other words, don't convert people, just get your base to the polls, the base that normally sits at home. That's why Stacey Abrams is winning right now in Georgia. That's why David Garcia is level pegging in Arizona and Gillum is slightly ahead in Florida. And you saw this play out in uh, Alabama last year when uh, Doug, uh, Roy Moore went up against Doug Jones. Now Roy Moore should have easily won that Senate seat. Absolutely should have been a cakewalk. But he got in trouble with the scandals and Roy and uh, Steve Phillips put a whole bunch of money into, into Alabama. They reinvigorated the communist networks there that had been there since the civil rights era. And they mounted a vote or die campaign amongst the black community. They told them if, they, if the Republican won, the Klan was coming back. That's what they told them, right? And they won by 20,000 votes. And the head of CARE in Alabama, the Muslim organization, boasted that Muslims won the election because they were part of this coalition and they, they got 20,000 Alabama Muslims to the polls and they all voted for the Democrat and that was the margin of victory. So this is a strategy they are pro put doing right now right across the South. Now I want to tell you who they're going to run for the presidency in 2020. See if, see if I'm on track with this. Now, at Stanford University, Steve Phillips had a young black friend, a football player, who was a radical, but he wasn't a hardcore radical, but he was pretty bad. And Steve Phillips remained friends and funded his career and put a lot of money behind him. And in 2013, he got him elected as senator from New Jersey. That is Cory Booker. Okay? Spartacus, right? So... He also had a young, um, young half Asian, half black friend at, at Stanford, and she was a militant radical. 
and she became a top operative in the Hillary Clinton campaign. And her husband, a man called Tony West, on Steve Phillips's recommendation, because Steve Phillips was appointing all sorts of people to the Obama administration, he became a top official in Eric Holder's Justice Department. He was number three or four or something like that. And his wife is a woman called Maya Harris. And her sister is a woman called Kamala Harris, the senator from California, who has just been in Iowa stumping up support for her presidential run. So they are going to run Kamala Harris and Cory Booker at the top of the ticket. Well, either one of them or both of them on the ticket, probably with Kamala Harris at the top. And they're going to rerun the Rainbow Coalition strategy against what they hope is a very damaged President Trump. And they're going to energize the black and Latino base all over the South. And they're going to win with 51, 52, 53% of the vote. This is their plan. Then they legalize every single illegal immigrant in the country. They ramp up refugee resettlement from the Middle East. And really, you will then become a minority in your own country. That's the plan. Now, does any of this sound over the top or incredible or unbelievable to anybody? This is exactly what they're doing, folks. But the good news is this. President Trump put a big spanner in their works. And that's why they're freaking out, because their whole plan is based on racial politics, identity politics, and motivating people by race. And if President Trump is successful, and a lot of these minorities start making a lot of money and doing okay, that all falls by the wayside. That's all done. So they're desperate to win this election and impeach the president and desperate to win the next election. And if they do that, the country is on a downward trajectory. But if we can win this election and we will easily win the Senate, and if we can hold the House, which we have a good chance of doing, President Trump will easily win 2020. And he'll do very well in 2022 and he'll set up a successor for 2024. And I'll tell you what, people, by that time, you'll feel a lot of schadenfreude because those Democrats will be done, people. They'll be suffering like you wouldn't believe. So what I'm saying is we're at a crossroads, and we've got to take these elections very seriously because the ne election in two weeks, is if, we, if it goes badly, we go down quick. But if it goes well, we set up a virtuous, positive cycle that could go on for decades. You know, you saw what Reagan did after Jimmy Carter screwed things up for four years. It didn't take long for Reagan to bring prosperity back to America, and that is still lasting today. Right? So you imagine had we had two terms of Jimmy Carter, where we'd be right now. So elections do make a difference. In every election cycle, they say, this is the most important election cycle of our lives. Well, this one actually is. Because in either two weeks' time, the Make America Great agenda is going to stop, or it's going to roll on, people. Now, what do you want to happen? Roll on. Absolutely. So, now, the, the, just say a couple of things. I was not a Trump supporter, believe me. I was as close to never Trump as you could get. But when he had, went up against Hillary Clinton, I knew there was no choice. And the big doubt I had with Trump is that he wouldn't do what he said he was going to do. Not that I didn't like his message. I didn't believe he would do it. And I am very glad to be proved wrong. Have you seen any president, since Reagan at least, who has done more to fulfill his promises in his first term of office than this one. No. Not even close, people. And that's worth encouraging. And that is with one hand tied behind his back, folks, because he has a very thin majority in the Senate, which gives Mitch McConnell a whole bunch of power. Right? And you've got, you know, two of his senators, Elisa Murkowski and, uh, and Susan Collins, who may as well be Democrats, so he has done all of those things with a razor-thin majority, not even a real majority. So you imagine what the president could do 
if he had five or six real patriotic senators behind him. Imagine the difference, folks. Because I'll tell you straight, if we win the House, Jim Jordan has a very good chance of becoming the leader of the House. Great man. He will change that body. And I'll tell you what, if that happens, and we get five or six more senators, because there's, there's at least seven or eight seats that we could win in the Senate, and all of them have good conservatives in them. So if President Trump has six or seven or three or four good senators behind him, he will be unleashed, people. Don't you think he's just frustrated? Don't you think he's just champing at the bit to actually do stuff? Get that wall built? Tell you what, if we get him that majority, they will be turning the turf on that wall early next year. Guarantee it. You know? So, so this is the things we could do. Just think of what we could do. If he's got a healthy majority in the Senate, well, he's already taken us out of the Paris Climate Accords. He's taken us out of NAFTA. He's um, taken us out of the U UNESCO, of UNESCO, a Marxist scam, the United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization, taking us out of the Human Rights uh, UN Human Rights Commission. Well, I think he would genuinely like, if we could get behind him, to take us right out of the UN, full stop. Wow. Now, wouldn't that be a great favor to your children, folks? And you look at another favour to your children. You had the best public education system in the world for 200 years, folks, until Jimmy Carter screwed it up with the Department of Education. Well, I think we need to pressure President Trump to axe it, to return all education back to the states, right? So they can stop, stop you, stop them brainwashing your children. So you can teach them in your own values again. And there's a whole bunch of things, you know, there's a whole bunch of government departments that are completely unconstitutional. You imagine what we could do. Right now you've got a 5-4 majority in the Supreme Court. Now Ruth Bader Ginsburg is getting pretty old, folks. And she has said she would like to retire in New Zealand. Well, I'm willing to take one for the team, folks. Right? <laughs> I'm willing to welcome her down there. We'll look after her in her dotage. You know, we'll look after her because you could get a 6-3 majority. You might even have a 7-2 majority by the time President Trump finishes his second term. What is that going to do for your First and Second Amendment rights, folks? For your religious liberties? You would have a realistic chance of overturning Roe v. Wade like you've never seen before. Think of all the fantastic things that could be done if this agenda keeps rolling on and we give the president a good, healthy majority in the Senate and hold the House. Now, is that within your power to do? Absolutely. You know, you know how, they, how close these things can be. You know, like, um, you know, remember the old hanging chads in Florida in 2000? 500 votes decided the presidency. And if had Al Gore had won that, you would have all died of boredom in the first term of office, folks. You imagine the consequences of that. So what I'm saying in this state, you've got two seats you're likely to take off the Democrats, but there's a couple of seats you might lose to the Democrats. You need to get involved in those seats if you can, folks, in those races to make sure we don't lose any. Because there's only 23 seats different in the House. 23 seats. And we're going to make sure Minnesota picks up a couple of Republican seats and holds the ones it's already got. Now, I know that some of these Republicans aren't exactly the Republicans that you would get behind, want to get behind. But right now, this is a referendum on the Trump agenda. You know, President Trump can only do what he has to do if he's got enough R's behind him. And they may not be the best, you know, I, I look at the Republican Party this way. I think about a third of, them, their third of them are big government progressives. I think about a quarter of them are patriots and constitutionalists. And I think the rest couldn't tie their own shoelaces, right? But that quarter 
could become the leading quarter and it could become a third. And the go-alongs, to get-alongs, will go along with them. If we have the leadership of the House and we get the leadership of the Senate behind President Trump people, I don't think there's any stopping us. You can see a change in American politics like you have not seen since the revolution. You think I'm exaggerating a little bit, you know, going a bit... You know, I know it's not all that easy and things don't go the right way. But I know if we blow this, I know what we've got in the negative side. But I'm telling you what, people, we've got a huge positive side there as well. And the difference may be one or two seats. Could be very, very close. So what I'm asking from all of you, if you're not already involved, and see, and you also got a very good chance of getting Jeff Johnson in, you've got a great chance of um, defeating Keith Allison, and there's at least three or four congressional races here you can make a difference in. If you're not involved in the campaign right now, please get involved. If you're already doing some phone banking, take on extra shifts. If you're already doing door knocking, do some extra. If you've already written out a check, write out another one. And if you haven't, write one and put it and double what you're originally planning to do. I'm really serious, folks. Because your investment in the next two weeks could make more difference to the fate of your children and your children's future than any other period of political activism in your life. This is critical, people. So much depends on what we do over the next couple of weeks. And it could come down to a very tight margin. I'm a bit fired up tonight, so I'll say this thing. <laughs> right? There's a lot of people who don't want to get involved in politics because it's a dirty game. And I understand that because, well, of course it's going to be dirty if the good people aren't in it. And there's a whole bunch of Christians who won't even touch politics with a barge pole. You know, you, say, you, you look at this. If your neighbour is starving and you do nothing to help, is that a Christian thing to do? If your town is being flooded... And you don't go and try and man the sandbanks and, you know, man the pumps and try and save the town. And you sit at home on your computer. Is that a Christian thing to do? So if your country is going to hell in a handbasket and you do nothing to save it, is that a Christian thing to do? People, this country is a special country. It has a constitution that comes out of Mosaic law, representative government. It's the first country in the world that put God at the top. Your rights come from God. They come to the people and the people elect representatives to safeguard those rights. That's unique in world history, folks. That is what has given you all the blessings that you enjoy today. That system of government directly inspired out of the Bible. Do you think God wants to lose that, to see that go out on this earth? You know, what will what, what that do to everybody else on the planet, folks? Everybody loses hope if that happens. This is the hope of the world. So we all got to be involved. This is a civic duty. A civic, you know, how, how can a Christian say, I live in the freest, most prosperous country the world has ever seen? the country where I can practice my religion with no hindrance, that I can go home to a wonderful house and enjoy all sorts of creature comforts, and I have no responsibility for maintaining it for my, my children. None whatsoever. How can you say that? It doesn't make sense, does it? But that's the argument of many. So I can't promise you much, but I can promise you two things. If we do nothing, we risk our children living in slavery. And it ain't a small risk, it's a very high risk. But if you give it everything you've got that's within you, for your, const for your God, for your constitution, for your liberty, for your family, for your country, if you give it everything you've got, two things may happen. One, you may give it all of that and we still conceivably might lose. 
but at least you will all earn the right to look your children in the eye and say, I did everything I possibly did could for you people. Everything I could. And what is that worth to you? And if you win, and you absolutely can win this, because that last election proved to me beyond all doubt that God is not finished with this country yet, folks. If you win, you can spark a liberty boom like you've never seen before. You can spark an economic boom. You will spark, inspire liberty revolutions all over the planet. Don't you think the Australians and Brazilians and South Africans and French want freedom too, folks? And if it happens in America, it can happen over there. So if you give it everything and you keep on winning, you can spark an economic boom, a liberty boom, worldwide. And you can give your children not just the amazing country that you inherited, but one even greater. Is that worth a little bit of sacrifice, folks? Amen. So I want to say to you people, thank you so much for what you do for America and for my country and for liberty. God bless America and God bless Minnesota. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks,